Hello, good afternoon and welcome to Midday Live here on TV3. My name is Park Yasari. Coming up in the next 60 minutes. Coming up, one injured and property destroyed as rainstorm hits Kumasi. Also in the bulletin, six regions to experience load shedding for 12 hours. And U.S. revokes the entry visa for the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, Fatal Bensoda. We've got details of these stories plus many more coming up in the next 60 minutes. Be reminded that we're streaming live on Facebook. You can also join us with the views, comments and suggestions on any of our top stories this hour. Visit any of our social media pages on Facebook and on Twitter. Now, the electricity supply to parts of the country will be cut off for 12 hours on Friday as part of an ongoing load shedding management by the Power Distribution Services, PDS. PDS issued the timetable just this morning, announcing the new measures. A timetable issued on Friday morning by PDS listed the Ashanti, Greater Accra, including Tema, Centra, Volta, including Oti, Western, including Western North, and Eastern regions as the affected areas. A number of towns and areas within the affected regions will have their electricity supply cut off from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Friday, April 5. PDS explained that generation deficit varies and for which reason PDS may review the outages based on supply from their upstream. It also said the outages on Friday are as a result of the shutdown of the Atuabo gas processing plant. The decision to release the timetable was reached at a meeting between Power Distribution Services PDS, Volta River Authority and the Public Utilities and Regulatory Commission PURC on Thursday. Meanwhile, a late evening rainstorm Thursday ravaged parts of Kumasi in the Ashanti region and rendered hundreds of residents, including students, homeless. Dozens of buildings were also destroyed. Now, some buildings collapsed while others had their roofs ripped off. Metal containers and kiosks serving as shops have been swept away from their locations by the rainstorm, which some residents described as huge. Electricity to most of the affected areas of the city has been cut off because many electricity poles have been uprooted by the rainstorm, which started at about 6 p.m. and lasted for an hour. There were also reports of some, some of the rain destroying uh, one of the dormitories of um, Asantiman SHS. Right, so a late evening rainstorm on Thursday ravaged parts of Kumasi in the Ashanti region and rendered hundreds of residents, including students, homeless. Dozens of buildings were also destroyed. Let's get, let's get some more uh, updates on this developing story. Kofi Edidonfe is a Northern Region uh, Bureau Chief. He joins us on the phone lines. Thanks, Kofi, for your time. So what is the situation now with the affected residents? Well, indeed, um, some people are already counting their loss um, at the level of destruction. Uh, one thing that is very surprisingly disturbing is um, the ability of um, the National Disaster Management Organization to deal with some of these issues. One vehicle that had a tree falling on it is still trapped, and uh, people are wondering when they are going to clear the debris. I spoke to a car dealer at this particular uh, place around the Swam Runabout, who says throughout last night they managed to clear some of the, of the areas of um, some capillaries, but unfortunately, there is no equipment to clear the actual trunk of a tree that is on the vehicle. Also, Power had been cut to a number of areas because some of the trees fell on, on, uh, on the cables. And uh, people are still in darkness um, as, as we speak now. Um, you go around and you see a number of billboards and questions are being asked as to the quality of construction of some of these billboards. 
because the destruction to the billboards are so enormous and uh, some devastation has also been caused by these uh, billboards uh, sited in uh, communities across um, the metropolis. And Kofi, with regards to those displaced, how do they spend the night? Well, people had no other choice than to put up with their relatives and people close by who uh, probably did not have their um, houses and structures uh, attached. But um, the, the most um, serious situation was at the Asantaman Senior High, uh, where um, the, the, one of the dormitories of the school um, had the roof being ripped off. And uh, the students um, had challenges uh, last night having places to uh, put their heads. Uh, but the headmaster had assured that um, the situation is under control and uh, is seeking help to ensure that um, academic activities and also the students have places uh, to put their heads uh, going into um, the, the, the future. Uh, I heard you report, Kofi, also that there were trips to uh, uh, electricity in, in most of the affected areas. Uh, do we know whether there have been any efforts at all to restore power back to these areas? Well, for that, I think it can only be, power can only be restored when um, the um, cables have been put back to their shape because um, the trees and other billboards also fell on some of these uh, power cable the lines. And the uh, ECG, uh, I mean, the, the power distribution company, I understand, is uh, working on how it can put the wires back on stream before power can be restored to these areas um, as we speak now. Thanks very much, uh, Kofi Ejidonfa. It's our Northern Region uh, Bureau Chief joining us on the phone lines with the very latest updates coming in from the Ashanti region. So the big news is that a late evening rainstorm on Thursday ravaged parts of Kumasi in the Ashanti region and rendered hundreds of residents, including students, homeless. Now, dozens of buildings were also affected and destroyed. Some buildings collapsed while others had their roofs ripped off. Metal containers and kiosks serving as shops have been swept away from their locations by the rainstorm, which some residents described as huge electricity to most of the affected areas of the city has also been cut off because many electricity poles have been uprooted by the rainstorm which started at about 6 p.m and lasted for well over an hour there were also reports of some of the rains destroying uh, one of the dormitories of the asantiman senior high school Those are visuals from yesterday's uh, downpour, which uh, destroyed many homes and, and, and led many to be displaced. We're trying hard to establish contact with the National Disaster Management Organization to get their side of the story and to find out what they're going to do about uh, the destruction to properties and, and particularly for those who've been displaced, what measures they are putting in place to have them, uh, you know, go back. All right, so we've just been joined on the line by the NADMO Regional Director, uh, Kwabna Sanctuary. Uh, thanks, Kwabna, for your time. So what is NADMO's own assessment of the situation? Hello, Kwabna, can you hear me? Uh, I'm afraid uh, we've got to re-establish contact with uh, Kwabna Sanctuary, who is uh, the NADMO uh, director there in the Ashanti region. Kwabana, if you can hear me, what is NADMO's own assessment of the situation in the Ashanti region? Well, I'm afraid we're unable to reach Kwabana on the phone line. She's still watching Media Live here on TV3. You can join us with your views, comments, and suggestions, particularly if you're in the Ashanti region and you're affected by last night's downpour. Uh, just send us a message on Facebook or go on our Twitter page. Let's know what you uh, are feeling at the moment and uh, whether or not you've been displaced by yesterday's downpour. And uh, let's get on the phone lines again and speak to the NADMO Regional Director, Kwabana Century. Uh, thanks, Kwabana, for your time. So what is NADMO's own assessment of the situation in the Ashanti region. Good afternoon, your viewers. We, are, we have not done with the assessment. So I hope uh, by the course of the day we might be finished with that the entire assessment. Well while you while you work at getting to the conclusion of, mm -hmm. of yesterday's uh, you know downpour and what may have uh, you know caused uh, those to be displaced, how quick can that more get to the aid of the displaced persons? Yeah, I think uh, uh, there's a lot of disaster, you know, especially the schools and the 
I mean, private homes and churches and companies. So <clears throat> that means we are in position of uh, trying to make sure uh, the roof of, uh, roof of the various schools is our priority. Because most of the schools, like uh, Asantimai, uh, Asantimai and, and the other schools, it is a lot of them. We are trying to see, and the people are to embark on uh, efforts. So we are trying to see if Admo can do something before we get back to the various, the private homes and other institutions. Do we know exactly what happened at the Asantimai Senior High School? Yeah, we, we've been there since yesterday. I and the city mayor, we were there last night. As early as 6 a.m. this morning, we were in the school. And uh, we demand the wrong information that the people put, it, put out there on the social media and other platforms. There is no injury and nothing like some students have been collapsed, taken to hospitals. Nothing of such can happen in the school. So it's a false information that the people put out on the social media. And oh. in the school, in the school, the Nadmo has done the assessment and uh, the polytank, we have told the KMA mayor, we happen to be an alma mater of the Asantima Senior High School, that they should take care of it. And Nadmo, we are also going to take care of the the rip of of the uh geometry. All right, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sanchua, um, who is with the Ashanti Regional NADMO, giving us updates of yesterday's rainstorm, which uh, destroyed uh, several homes and, and got many displaced. Uh, we're trying to establish contact with the public relations officer of the Power Distribution Services Company, Mr. Boatin, to also get his perspective on this matter. Meanwhile, electricity supply to parts of the country will be cut off for 12 hours on Friday as part of an ongoing load shedding management by the Power Distribution Services. Now, PDS issued the timetable just this morning announcing the new measures. Right away from that, let's do some politics. And the National Democratic Congress says the Vice President's announcement of a 50% reduction in general port charges and 30% on vehicle importation was illegal. At a public lecture in Accra, the party insisted the reduction in the benchmark valuation of port charges uh, as negligible and insignificant. Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Baumia and the economic management team announced a reduction in valuation port charges effective April 4. Reacting to the NPP government's first town hall meeting on the economy, the former Deputy Finance Minister and ranking member of the Finance Committee in Parliament, Atu Forsen, said the move by government was illegal quoting the Customs Act 2015, Act 891. This Act, Act 891, makes the introduction of benchmark value or benchmark valuation illegal. This was done under the NDC, and we insist that under the NDC, we put in place measures to abolish benchmark valuation. Because at the time, Ghana was not compliant under the World Customs Organization and World Trade Organization. So in order for us to be compliant, we have to come out with this act to ensure that we become compliant and also to outlaw it. Unfortunately, my opinion, I think because it is illegal for us to um, implement or use benchmark valuation, as we speak, benchmark valuation should not even be used as a way of assessing customs or import duties. So I see no reason why government has decided to instead reduce it by half but rather what they should do is outlaw it completely because benchmark valuation is illegal, it's against World Customs Organization, it's against World Trade Organization. Speaking on the May event of the Coalition for Restoration, Member of Parliament for Bolga Central, Isaac Adongo, downplayed the port charges, describing it as reckless. Adam Smith says that when he reduces his import duty, traffic that was going to a free port in Togo, a free portal will be directed to our port because at least they'll pay something. Hey. <laughs> Who has ever left free and come to pay something? 
So, Adam Smith, your reason for plugging the loophole is a sign of fiscal recklessness. Meanwhile, former President John Mahama has cautioned the governing New Patriotic Party to be truthful with their comments on the economy or risk being exposed. He spoke at a lecture on Ghana's economy organized by the Coalition for Restoration. The NDC flag bearer said the pockets of Ghanaians do not reflect the so-called achievements of the New Patriotic Party. In putting out your communication as a public relationist, you try to present your institution or the person that you are trying to promote in the best possible light. And so you might sometimes be selective with your figures, present the best things, and then push the negative things to the background. But our lectures always reminded us that beware of your reality and keep your public relations and your communications as close to your reality as possible. And so we must keep our communications as close to our reality as possible. And so it is sometimes when people lose sight of that reality and begin to believe in their own propaganda, that is when you see some of the effects that we are seeing. And so the paraphrase I'll leave you with is, you can do all the lies and propaganda with the economy you like. The reality of the people's lives will expose you. In other news, government has commissioned a forensic audit into the establishment of the Commander Sugar Factory. A transaction advisor reports on a strategic investor has been submitted to the Ministry of Trade awaiting a final decision at the end of April. What has the ministry done? During a technical evaluation, doesn't add up. The question submitted by the Member of Parliament for the Commander Edina Iguafu will bring constituency which has lingered for long on the minds of many especially in commander the commander sugar factory records indicate after eight commissioning in may 2016 was shut down shortly thereafter with concerns of lack of raw material and maintenance upon assumption of office by the mpp government did an assessment of the factory a test run was never completed before the factory was commissioned due to the unavailability of sufficient sugarcane for the test run. The factory on commissioning was not in a position to produce the required refined white sugar due to the absence of the following processing component units, which were not fully installed during the test run. The melt qualification units, the vertical crystallizers, and the dosing system. Overall, about 35 items have not been installed on commissioning, although they are critical for the production of sulfurless white sugar. It is not in our interest as a government to be running a sugar factory. The government has also commissioned an audit into the full cost of the factory. The previous government took a loan of $35 million to, as it were, this We've done a series of financial valuations and on record the value that is put now on the factory is significantly less than the uh, value of the plant as uh, one would determine based on the load that uh, was, uh, was, was procured. So we have had to deal also with that uh, challenge. And um, a forensic audit uh, has actually been commissioned uh, uh, to go into this exercise. But the minority in the parliament is wondering how much the state will incur after the audit. This place can hire directly and indirectly about 7,500 people. Where is your sense of urgency? That you've been in office over two years? and you are taking your time, 7,500 people. Some of them could be youth, some of them could be older people. So where is the sense of urgency? 
All right, so we're going to stay a while longer in Parliament. My colleague Kwacha Frenuyama is in the House monitoring the very latest developments. Uh, Komala, <laughs> Kwachi, sorry, uh, Kwachi, what can you report from Parliament? Yes, yeah, so uh, the Member of Parliament for the Futsi Constituency Party uh, on the matter of the reopening of the University of Education whenever next week, Monday, and also the Governing Council's decision concerning the reinstatement of three of the 23 lecturers and staff who were suspended by the investment side. The decision by the investment government council is a half big one. According to the uh, future member of parliament, in fact, uh, the deliberation they had with the minister in charge of education on the matter a couple of weeks ago uh, related to the reinstatement of all 23 employees of the investment. In fact, this is a, a, a resolution we know uh, UTAC is also pushing for. He wants the incumbent Vice Chancellor, Professor Apple Roni, to personally intervene uh, in this matter. And on the matter of the, this uh, decision, the reinstatement of all 23 lectures leading to a breakdown in discipline in the investment as you heard from the public in relations officer of the investment, uh, Mr. Alexander Fayomakin says that will certainly not happen. That is a, a necessary recipe uh, for breeding peace on the university campus, and he expects the university management, particularly led by the Vice Chancellor, Professor Apoponi, to lead and ensure that this actually happens. All right, uh, Afra Kwachin Yama, thank you very much for the very latest updates from. Parliament and on our MTN video report today, Seidu Lari Salifu reports from uh, Tingoli in the northern region on the daily struggles for water. This is the source of drinking water for the villages Tingoli and Dasuyili, in the river which is almost dry. The remaining source which is more or less like stagnant water. More than five years now, after the peoples have contributed by themselves to enlarge this river and even created pumps for it, where they could pump when the water rises during the rainy season. Now the pumps are all spoiled. The river is closing up and water doesn't stay there for long. This is mud all over. Yet people are drinking mud. Look at the color of this water. Do you call this water? Look at it. Animals and human beings drinking water together. This is the second source of water we're talking about. As you can see, the women are scorching from holes created by themselves near the river. This water comes out. Look at that tiny water there. Check this old lady out. She has been scorching from this water since morning. And yet she doesn't even have a full jerk and it's still empty. Look at it. My name is Larry Salifu and I'm reporting from Tingoli. And just like Larry and Tingoli, you can also send your video report via WhatsApp on 055-143-344. That's 055-143-344. You're still watching Media Live here on TV3. A reminder, we're streaming live on Facebook. You can send us your views and comments on our top stories so far. We'll do well to share them with the rest of the world. Stay still ahead in the bulletin, we've got business, sports and international news. Hello other and welcome to the business uh, news segment on Midday Life here on TV3. Uh, now let's begin with uh, former Greek Minister Fifi Kwete who has accused the new patriotic party government of eroding the economic gains they inherited from the John Mahama administration. Addressing a cross-section of Ghanaians at a lecture organized on the economy, Mr Kwete said it's about time both parties acknowledge the contribution of each other to the socio-economic development of the country. Of course, we did acknowledge that over the period that they've been in power, positive growth was sustained, just as it was sustained throughout the period, the, the, the preceding eight years of the NDC. We acknowledge that. 
we acknowledge however there were difficulties and we settle on making sure that we resolve the problem but look at i mean what our friends have done in spite of the massive uh, economy that we have actually bequeathed to them no day has passed without trying to create the impression that everything has been nothing but shambolic under their tenure i think going forward both should be able, we both of us should be able for the sake of ghana to learn to 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 accommodate the good things that have been done and still be able to say that regardless of, of that, somebody possibly is doing better than the other, but it should be very genuine. And I think that would be, that, that would be very good for Ghana. Away from that, the chief executive officer of Magdan Group of Companies, Dr. Daniel Macaulay, has added his voice to the call to, to the call for graduates to consider entrepreneurship. He insisted that graduate unemployment will continue if graduates do not change their orientation on aspiring to work in the public sector. The Ghana Labor Force Survey report by the Ghana Statistical Service in 2017 pegged the unemployment rate at 11.9% in 2015, a rise of about 6% since 2012 and 2013. According to the Institute of Statistics, Social and Economic Research of the University of Ghana, only 10% of graduates find jobs after their first year of completing school, with a larger number of them securing employment after 10 years. This is due to varied challenges that range from the lack of employable skills, unavailability of funding capital for entrepreneurship, poor attitudes of graduates towards job opportunities, as well as the low capacities of industry to absorb the huge numbers. The data contradicts Goal 8 of the Sustainable Development Goals, which seeks to ensure that countries promote inclusive and sustainable economic growth, employment and decent work for its citizens. Speaking at an entrepreneurship seminar by the Department of Development Education Studies of the University of Development Studies in Tamale, Dr. McCauley said attitude and consistency are key in entrepreneurship. If you want to be very successful in life, what makes a difference is your attitude. 70% is the attitude you acquire in your know, progression in life. That's what makes you successful. All right, so we're going to cross over now to Parliament. Um, uh, I'm told uh, Mr. Afenyo Markin is addressing Parliament at the moment. We're going to take uh, that feed live. Uh, my colleague, Kwacha Afenyo, will bring us that right now. Things are done. If we allow things to degenerate and we show oh, it is academic freedom, autonomy and all that, one day it will come back and haunt all of us. What was wrong yesterday remains wrong today and will remain wrong tomorrow. Let's look at the critical issues and address them once and for all. So that at the end of the day, all those affected staff will see themselves as one. I'm sure that if the issues are properly addressed, the lecturers, the workers, and the students would also be more than willing to work with Father Fubroni. I've spoken to the Utah national president. I've engaged a lot of the stakeholders. And their key concern is the reinstatement of their colleagues, the compensation paid to those in authority before this whole impasse, so that we allow the sleeping dog to lie. That's all. Now, as the students make their way back onto campus, what will be your message for peaceful coexistence and harmony on campus? Like I've said, it depends on the posture of the vice chancellor. I am calling on him to play that role that would give people hope and people have, would have assurance in him. You see, a situation where people feel that because they have a disagreement with you, they are like, likely to be victimized, it's not too right. We need a peaceful U UEW. UEW must make progress. UEW brand must be a brand of choice. All these can best be achieved if we have a leadership that is showing commitment 
that commitment will come from the VC. It is not a council. It is not any other individual. It is not a member of parliament. It is the VC. And if the VC is ready to lead that charge, I'm, I'm more than, more than, more than, more than assured that uh, things would, would, would turn for the better. You see that? All right, you heard Member of Parliament for a foot to Afenu Markin addressing uh, journalists at the foyer of Parliament. Let's return to our business stories now. The government has secured support from Oracle, an international agency in technology, to leverage its ICT for 500 startup businesses in the country. The Vice President, Dr. Mamadou Baumia, who launched the deal, is confident it could be expanded to cover 1,500 businesses soon. Oracle is an international IT solution agency which provides support to all businesses. For the first time in Africa, it has agreed to partner governments to set up a secretariat in a country to support 500 business startups. Vice President Dr. Mohamed Baumia is elated. The partnership would expand business opportunities. Today, it is not by coincidence that Google has decided to set up its headquarters for artificial intelligence in Africa in Accra. And it is not by coincidence that Oracle has decided to set up its first such partnership in Africa again in Ghana. And we are very thankful. He also urged managers of the agency to capitalize on government digital drive to expand their operations. Information technology has contributed to the rapid digitization of a large percentage of interactions in the world. More advanced countries are on the cusp of new innovation, constantly rolling out new technology to improve daily life and simplify hitherto daunting mundane tasks. The Minister of Communications, Esela Owusu Ekufo, expressed government's determination to empower the youth through technology to enable them become competitive in the global world of work. Oracle Global Startup Ecosystem is a unique acceleration program for startups that puts the vast technology and business resources of Oracle behind emerging businesses to help them scale up and succeed. The global program, which serves startups at scale by enabling next generation growth, business development, and drives cloud-based ingenuity for startup consumers, creating a cycle of innovation. The director of Global Startup Ecosystem for Oracle, Maria Foni, said the support for businesses in Ghana is due to its macroeconomic stability. What we are launching in Ghana is this partnership with the government of Ghana represents a shared commitment to the long-term success of the startup community here. The partnership between government and Oracle has been dubbed Ghana Oracle Digital Enterprise Program. That's it for the very latest in business news. We'll take a short break and return with the very latest in sports with Thierry Nyan. Right, in entertainment this afternoon, former First Lady Nana Kone Dajman Rawlins has been encouraging Ghanaians to patronize a local fabric and made in Ghana wear. Nana Kune Dwajiman Rawlins' fashion sense and love for style is undoubted. She's always gone for the colorful Ghanaian fabric ahead of any other choice. I do things my own way, I do my, I write my own style. Um, I like European fashion, yes, but I like to model it in the African way. Nana Kunedu Ajiman Rollins, a special guest asked the 2019 Abbey Creation Fashion College graduation, noted the Ghanaian fashion scene has made strides worth commending. Personally, I think that the design industry has really grown in a very big way. Ghanaians are more conscious of what they want to wear, what colors they, they want to wear. Their fashion sense has completely changed. Of course, there's more to be done, but they are, they are pretty much above what I expected. She encouraged the graduates not to just add up to numbers, but to be innovative and make a difference with their designs. Every country that has developed to a certain level has pushed 
A students in the area of sometimes apprenticeage, what you call the vocational schools and so on. Because if you don't have carpenters, how do you build? You don't have masons, how do you build? You don't have painters, how do you build? You need these skills. And anybody who would tell you that everybody going to a university is a plus, obviously has no clue of how to run a country. So the university students must actually think of what trade they can also learn to attach it to whatever degree they have and fly with it. Abigail Tre is the founder of Abby Creations. So the design that they are bringing on the market is very well sewn. Formerly you see most clothes with very bad finishing, but now when you check the finishing, the designs put together are very well arranged. So I know what they are going to do out there. I know they are ready for the world. In other news, the tourism ministry has initiated an, an ambitious move of get a lot of, of, of get a lot of people of African origin to return home, dubbing this year the year of return. And several activities have been initiated to make this a reality. Today, as part of plans to get the youth to be active participants in the year of return, the ministry has launched a youth bias festival called Yoto Fest. Of the Ministry of Tourism, Arts and Culture. I officially launch the Youth in Tourism Festival for the year 2019. The Yoto Fest is one of the many initiatives by the Ministry of Tourism to boost its initiative of declaring this year the year of return. The festival is to ensure a high participation of the youth and also increase on a whole internal tourism. Under the theme, my culture, my pride. Yotofest, or the Youth in Tourism Festival, was launched with high profile participation. Students from various institutions also graced the occasion in their numbers as key beneficiaries of Yotofest. Representatives from the Fashion Designers Union of Ghana, Faduga, also had artworks to put the festival in artistic perspective. Joseph Amate is the executive director of the Tourism Society of Ghana. Look at the initiative of where Ghana, see Ghana, eat Ghana. Of course, we can tell this by the youth. So we realize that something has to be meant for them. They feel that it's only those who are in school who can patronize domestic tourism. But we said, no, it is meant for everybody. We are also organizing uh, lectures and workshops that are going to educate the youth in this very country. So those who are doing the fashion designing. They are showing the beautiful African way. They need to be recognized. They need to celebrate them. So this festival is also meant for that. Then the next day, we are organizing a tour to Cape Coast, specifically Cape Coast Castle and then uh, uh, Elmina Castle. We are expecting over 40,000 youth of this very country to be part of this festival. Well, that's all for Midday Life here on TV3. Thanks very much for watching. For more news, you can log on to our website, 3news.com. My name is Pa Kwesi Asari.